Okay, so our session is on branding, and uh, this was going to be a, a joint presentation between Mike and I, but I was telling Mike yesterday that uh, for one of the first times as I was getting ready, he said, well, what are you going to talk about? And I said, I don't know. God hasn't given me anything. And uh, so I take that as a cue that Mike's supposed to do most of the talking, because normally I have no problem filling up all the time that's available, right? Which is okay. But he did give me one thing. Just real quick thing that uh, I'll do, do the uh, intro to and then Mike can add the meat to it. Is as I was thinking about branding this morning, is that, you know, at the end of the day as a Christian and trying to bring uh, God and, and his character and nature into the marketplace, really our primary first priority brand is to be his brand. And I know that uh, we all know that intellectually, and sometimes we're able to execute that, but it, it renewed my enthusiasm and my dedication as I thought about it to make sure that the brand that not only I'm marketing, but that I'm actually bringing forth is his brand. And the best scripture that he led me to in this area, and I hope this relates to you because it did relate to me, is, you know, where Jesus in John 15 is talking about the vine and the branches. And it's just the very first part to that, just as a reminder in 15.1, it says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. And I just felt that somebody here, I did, needed to hear that every branch that he prunes, he's doing it so that you're even more fruitful. And so I hope that we can all embrace that pruning process that the Father does with us, even at our deepest heart level, because, you know, again, there's always something inside of us that the Father can work on to bring that deliverance and bring healing and to allow us to be more fruitful in his kingdom, to be uh, less self uh, more selfless, you know, more caring, more giving, more loving, you know, more serving. And so I just felt that from a branding standpoint, that's what I'm going to try to focus on. And I hope uh, we all can do that. Now, Mike's got a, uh, a wonderful presentation. So let's welcome Mike up on branding. Good morning. You know, um, something interesting uh, happened, I think, during Jim's prayer. I was thinking one thing that I wanted to make sure that I said at the very beginning was everyone think of one thing during this teaching that you can take away and implement. And the moment that I was thinking through that, my mind was right as Jim was praying that. So take that as an, a super encouragement that there's no way in both sides of this that everyone's going to get it, implement it, and be down the path to success. You just It's just not ingrained in us to just get something the first time. So be watching for and listening for one thing that you can just get and implement. So um, just as a matter of introduction, my name is Mike Saunders. My company is Marketing Huddle. I help people with authority positioning, which is taking this branding and helping your target audience understand exactly what you do, but from a position of credibility so that when they look at competition, you're the obvious choice. Um, and let's just start off with Christian business branding. In reality, it's branding from, like what Jim just said, from having the right heart attitude. Because I think we can, as Christian entrepreneurs, have almost like a selfish and a prideful approach to our business, where we just want to get more and do more and have more. But why do we want that? And if our focus is set correctly, then the branding that we'll talk about today will fall into place. Um, secondly, branding is not your logo. It's not picking colors. It's not how your logo looks. It's the ethos of your company. It's your brand positioning. It's, your, it's what your prospects think of you and your company when someone says it. So think of it like this. Um, BMW cars, safe or not, um, high end or not, right? And they spend a lot of money to make sure that you, you know that. As, as, in fact, last night I was reading um, the back page here. This, uh, this uh, top graphic is, comes from the book Fascinate. Um, and I would encourage you to get it. It's a really, really good book. But one of the examples in there is how the jewelry company Tiffany's 
has spent so much money over the years on their elite brand. Well, a few years back, they came out with a low-end brand that a lot of teen girls were getting into, and it was some bracelet or, or whatever that it was, but the point was it took off really fast, and Tiffany's didn't like that because they did not want their brand to be so easily accessible to everybody. They wanted it to be elite. So they started raising the price to kind of make, and, and they did it strategically, because if, if something is available to anybody, then it's not exclusive, and that's what their brand is known for. So let's start off with looking at the first verse here, Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. And we've heard that before. One word that I circle that jumps out at me is able, and I think we know that God is able, but the thought that came to me was, what can we do to make sure that we are setting the stage as much as possible for God to be willing and able to work in us, in our business? And the thing that jumped into my mind is Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God. So if we are seeking first the kingdom of Mike or the kingdom of whoever, right, your business, it's kind of like, God, come on, keep up. I'm, I'm barreling down the road, you know. So it, you need to make sure that God is in it, and you need to be that human being, not that human doing, and you need to be still and know that he is God. But if we keep Matthew 6, in mind, seek first the kingdom of God, now when we read Ephesians 3.20, it seems like it now will fall into place. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Look at that word think maybe we need to expand our thinking. Maybe um, part of our impact is I want to succeed in business so that a portion of all of my revenue and pro profits or proceeds can go to benefit and fill in the blank with you know, your passionate charity or, or nonprofit, right? So maybe you need to expand your thinking to go, I really want to benefit them even more. Lord, if I can you do this project, I'm going to give even more. And it's not so that I can get my eighth boat or fourth vacation house, it's for this bigger purpose. So I think that that expanding of our thinking for the purpose of benefiting others, the community, you know, with the mindset of seeking first the kingdom of God. So if you notice there, um, the Lord can help us make branding decisions that will give us favor over our competitors. Um, what I would, would even say too is, um, I went through a study a few years ago that was really good, it's called Blueprint for Life. So if you guys ever want to do like a, um, just a goal setting personal development study, just Google blueprint for life. It's literally $25 for the study and it's really expansive with CDs and workbook and all that. But one of the things that jumped out at me was um, the timeline. They give this example of the eternal timeline. And so let's say that we use, you know, 85 years old as the, you know, the end for us, you know, or 90 or whatever the, the number is. But we tend to think of, okay, 90, 95 years old, working backwards. You know, okay, so retirement, um, graduate, you know, getting married, kids, high school, college, things like that. But what they challenged in the study was think of our timeline in light of eternity. So what are, what are we doing right now in business and life? You know, maybe even this morning, but what are you gonna do in your business at the end of the day today, tomorrow, next week, that in light of eternity makes an impact? So I think that 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 sets the mindset. Um, literally, last night, it's just interesting how things come together. Like I mentioned with um, Jim's prayer, um, last night in church, we were doing a study on Daniel. And I, I pulled out my phone and I emailed myself to make sure that I added this to my notes here. So look at the line, the Lord can help us make brand new decisions that will give us favor over our competitors. And then last night, the teaching was on Daniel 6.3. Daniel was preferred over the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. That is favor over competitors, over opportunities. What is gonna make someone choose you? Has anyone ever said to you, you know, I just, we just really feel a good connection. And sometimes that's just part of your personality. Sometimes it's just how you approach business. But that comes from how, you know, da Daniel was given preferential treatment over who? presidents and princes. So if you want that same power, you know, um, the, the uh, Jeremy Camp song, you know, that same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in us. So it's not just some, you know, pipe dream, you know, God wants to bless us, 
but he needs us to have that right perspective. Um, let's look at Proverbs 9, 1 there. Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. So having sound wisdom is indispensable for navigating the branding process. And I want to bring your attention to that word process. When you talk about branding or, you know, reevaluating things in your business, it's a process. It's not a checkbox. You know, it's not a worksheet that you can go, did that, did that check, and okay, good, now let's go on to my accounting problem. It is a process of building and reevaluating because everyone in here has a business plan and reevaluates that every year, right? So, and I'm being facetious because I know that so many people don't, but you need to have that business plan and in a subsection of that business plan is a marketing plan. And then that, that's where this branding would come into play. You know, what are the things that are working now? Remember those things called um, yellow pages that people used to advertise in? That people now use as a doorstop or I've got a picture of, of uh, you know, if, you're, if your computer screen isn't you know, high enough, they, they put two yellow pages in there and put, it, put their monitor on that. Well, if you never reevaluated your marketing plan or business plan, you would never know what's working and what's not working. Every single customer you got in the past six to 12 months, do you know where they came from? Do you know where your money went to bring them in? And maybe you're spending a lot of money here, but they're coming from over here. So that's part of that reevaluation. So that gets back to that word process. Um, Let's look at John 16, 13. He will guide you into all truth. So when I think of that, I'm listening to the Holy Spirit when we're looking to optimize our brand. I think of things like guide us into all truth. Yes, from a spiritual sense, but from a business sense, what truth do we need to know about ourselves and our business that would project positive brand um, integrity to our target audience? So I think that sometimes, have you ever had that idea that comes to you and it's like, yes. And it's like nothing really revolutionary. It's not something, some patent that's gonna change the world. Sometimes it's just, it was there and, and when it came to you, you're like, yeah, 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 that's gonna work and now you can run with that idea. You know, maybe someone just mentions something to you in passing and, and it just falls into place because it was already there, you had that propensity, but now that concept or that idea, you're ready to bring it into action. So I think that that John 16, 13, he will guide you into all truth. Um, think of like brand integrity, brand loyalty. Um, you know, you get a lot of people, there's some case studies out there where um, someone that's 25 years old is driving X, you know, brand of car. In fact, there's a commercial um, out there right now, I think it's for Affinity, where the son's talking to the dad and he's like, I just can't believe, you know, you've taken this direction. And the camera pans over to the picture of, you know, dad and son in front of their BMW. And the concept there is he's deviated from the BMW brand. I can't believe that. Well, what brand loyalty do you want your customers and clients and prospects to have about you? But you can't develop loyalty until you've got it figured out your own self. So I think that's where we're going to take that wisdom and guiding into all truth. And if we're seeking first the kingdom of God and watching for, Lord, how do you want my brand to be perceived? And here's the other thing. When you start down that path, and, and we're going to get into just some, some practical things that you can use to you know, develop your brand or, or reinvent or create your brand, you got to keep it up. Have you ever seen um, someone with a Facebook page and you go there and the last post was February of 2011 or something? And it's like, uh. Or this new idea that you have and it lasts for a week or two. So you have to be prepared when you start thinking of branding. That's a direct reflection on your company and, and what you value. So you have to keep that going moving forward. Um, look at those two quotes there at the bottom of page one. Corporations don't create brands, people do. So what do you think that means? You can say anything you want on this side, but if on this side of your business you're doing something totally different, people see that. And, and what you do or don't do, the subtle things, the, the unconscious things that you or your brand um, do, that's what your customers and the market are going to say about you because everyone has pocket power. So who has a news publishing device in your pocket? We all do. And whether it's, how about this? Well, I don't use Twitter. Fine, but you use something. And I don't care if all you have is text. You can text that person and that person and that person and you just hit three people that that brand didn't 
have connection to. So when you think about people creating brands, that, that mindset that's out there about your company is created by things you're doing or not doing. And I think that that's the mentality that we need to keep in mind. And another thing is sometimes people will not call you up and say, I noticed this about you, and I am not going to come to you because of this, and I noticed this online, and I noticed this in your store, and one of your employees did this to me, so have a nice day. I'm not going to give you business. They don't do that, right? You wish they would because then you could fix that and say, okay, I lost a customer or 10 because people talk about negative things a lot more than positive. But the problem is you never know when that, those things happen. They just, the calls don't come in or the contacts don't come in. So we need to be doing as much as we can to make sure that the story that's being told about us and our brand is a positive one. And we can guide that story. Um, and it's not fabricating the story, it's guiding the story, the branding story. And then look at um, the second point there, different is better than better. So that's not a typo. Um, you know, if you wanna be better than your co competition, maybe you can't be better than them, literally but you can be different. And maybe that different is just enough to make you stand out in the mind of your prospect. Maybe there's a brand out there that's just a monster brand and people just fall at their feet and, and it's gonna give them business. But in reality, in your little sphere of influence, in your world, maybe being just enough different is enough. You know, as an example, let's say that you, you know, whatever, sell widgets or you provide a, a generic service and your big competitor does it just so huge and well and they're all over the internet, but you um, have a background in whatever, let's just call it trucking, I don't know. And you start going, you know what? I know the lingo of trucking industry and I know how to talk to them. I know what they need, what they don't need and my service of or my product of, I'm gonna focus on them. Well, now you can become different than that competitor because that major competitor is all things to all people. So different is better than better. You can't go in there and say, well, I'm better than so, than so and so company because maybe you're not. Maybe you're not worse, but maybe you're just not better than them, but you can be different. And you can, um, part of, you know, an elevator speech is saying, well, you know how typically people in the whatever industry do X, Y, Z? You know what? We do that, but where we're different is, and it's kind of like you need to have that mental divider line in someone's mind to go, yeah, they're different because they focus solely on the trucking industry. Huh. Now, does that mean you can never take on a client that's not in the truck? No, but for that specific um, vertical and niche, maybe you're going to join an association that has a lot of the trucking executives in there. So you might join another association six months down the road that's in a different vertical, but you can be different and that can be better than trying to trump or be better than someone because have you ever heard of the concept of um, don't compete on pricing? Well, that ties into branding, and here's why. If you lower your price and your competition sees that and lowers their price, and then you see that and you lower your price and you see that, and all of a sudden, your margins are so thin you can't buy a pack of gum. And there's always going to be someone that's going to, like, for instance, I, I used to say this, and now it's really in, in the news, but I used to say, um, do you know that Trump has some, a water company? I used to um, give the example, well, let's say that you had a water company and you, you wanted to compete on price. If Trump wanted to put you out of business with his water company, he would pay people to take his water, put you out of business, and then raise his prices right back up because people like that have the resources to just lower prices down to where you can't survive. And he can last it out a lot longer than you. So you never want to compete on price. You want to compete on what? Starts with a V, value. Well, if you, can, if you can add to value, you know, value slash brand integrity slash brand loyalty, what is that value you're bringing to your client base that you want to compete on? Well, doesn't that tie into different is better than better? So you want to be just enough different and you want people to know that about you and you want them, you don't want to have to have them dig through your materials or online or flyers to go, what in the world do they do? Sometimes I go to people's websites and I'm like, what exactly are you doing? I mean, you've got all that, but what do you do? What, what do you want me to know about you? And so you have to be super clear about that, but that branding comes into play because that becomes your value proposition. The branding is the foundation. The value proposition then is the tangible thing that you're going to provide to them. And then that creates the brand loyalty. So let's uh, turn over to page two on the back. Um, and I'm going to start on the bottom 
uh, graphic, and we're gonna talk about the two boxes on the left. Because once you know your competitive advantage, and that's a business term for what makes you different or better in that sense, once you can articulate that, and maybe that's a tagline, maybe that's a unique selling proposition, maybe that's your you know, six second elevator speech that makes people go, how do you do that? And then you can give them your 30 second elevator speech, and then they go, ooh, we need to get coffee, and then you can talk. Well, too many times people just get you know, hey, how you doing? I'm like, and just tell everything about everything about your company. And they're like, I just wanted to ask you a quick question. And so you need to have those little hooks in there, right? Well, that competitive advantage, when you can zero in on that languaging, that becomes a function of your branding because you cannot articulate your competitive advantage until you yourself know what your brand message is, your brand story, your branding is. So once you know that, now you can articulate a competitive advantage that teaches your prospects and customers why you're different and why that's better than being better than the competition. And by the way, you don't ever want to say, you know, well, you're not my competitor. They, you never want to name your competitors. You just want to say, you know, some in the industry, you know, they will do and they will have and, and they're great. But let me tell you what, I, I kind of noticed a gap in the industry. I noticed that when you have and you're not able to, so I wanted to fill that gap and that's why I started my company. That's why my service is such a unique offering. And there's a lot of power in certain words. And and if you ever are interested, just do a quick Google search on, you know, marketing power words. You know, things like, um, here's an example, discover. Discover the blah, 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 right? Well, I, I heard an example once where discover is such a powerful word because it incites curiosity. Well, discover card. You know, so there's, there's that kind of mystique of discover. Ooh, really? Um, so when you can get your brand message correct, and you can articulate that as your competitive advantage, and then look at the box right under that, target audience. If you, I don't think there's any car dealers in here, but if you sell cars, is your target audience anyone that drives? Maybe, but it should be like a, a, you zero in on a, a niche, a vertical. So in your business, who is your target audience? Now, that doesn't mean you can never do business with someone else that's not in that, but that, it, it's just that it, come, it becomes something where you want to attract mainly people that are in whatever that it is. And you see, I, I did an interview with a lady a couple weeks ago that helps her clients with females that are in sales, women selling. I think it was like women getting big sales. Well, she's really niched down her target audience to women and the sales you know, not just success in general, not just women that want to get success, it's women that want to get success in sales. Does that mean that if some guy comes to her and goes, hey, you know, you, uh, I've noticed that your book or your principles that you're teaching on, those would probably work for me, could you help me out? She's not gonna say no, it's just that she, what's gonna resonate in a certain vertical, certain target audience is gonna be that. So that's, if we look at those two boxes there, what is our competitive advantage, which is our branding that makes us different, that we can communicate clearly to our target audience. Now, going up to the, the last box, and this is where we'll spend the remainder of the time. Um, this is right from that book, Fascinate. So again, this is one image that talks about the seven languages of fascination. And, and the whole point of the book, Fascinate, is your brand needs to say something and it needs to fascinate people and it needs to be something that's interesting and how can you do that? So what the author talks about is these seven kind of languages and then how you can communicate using those languages. Well, we'll go through these seven and I'll, I, I wrote out some things on my notes here that you can write down next to each one and think about as we go through here, I know that each one of you have a business or a product or a service and maybe even it's like Mary Kay or a national brand, and you're not gonna rebrand them, but guess what you can brand the way you present this to your target audience. So even if you're working for a company or working with a national brand, you can still use these principles, but if you're trying to figure out, well, you know, I'm gonna give a little bit of a, you know, refresh to my brand. Look at some of these words. Do you want your brand to be known as or do you want to shoot for your brand building the concept of innovation? And, and the author calls this the language of creativity. So the words here are forward thinking, bold, surprising. Could your 
company be thought of as innovative? And I think that we can all think of, you know, like people that the, some of the tech companies or some of the firms out there that are known as being innovative. Maybe your company is not one, yeah, you know, I sell widgets and that's not all that innovative, so. Huh. But you know what? Innovation sometimes is thought of as like this. Doing the same old, same old, but doing it just a touch better or different. And that gets back to, oh, different is better than better. So that is actually an example of innovation. You don't have to think of innovation as some technological advance. Sometimes innovation is innovating a process or a system in your business so that, um, and, and here's, a, here's another new, in the marketing world, it's um, uh, the customer experience. Um, do you know what, uh, when you go, my daughter is graduating high school in like two weeks and they're going on their senior trip tomorrow and they're going to Disney. Well, guess what she's gonna see at Disney in Florida? All of the employees are on stage. Okay, um, have you ever heard of the companies like, oh, well, our associates or our partners, they're not employees that punch the clock, they're, they're being thought of and they're giving that brand perception as something a lot different. So for instance, you could just go to, um, think, think of it like this, um, which ticket costs more? A hometown carnival or Disney? Obviously. Um, how did Disney get to be Disney? In, in fact, I was talking to my mom on Mother's Day, and we were talking about uh, my daughter going to Disney, and she said, do you remember back in, you know, whatever year it was, but we drove from Virginia to Florida in a Volkswagen Beetle. Remember those little things with the engine in the back, right? And, um, and it was my sister and I in the back seat, and my mom, and, you know, we were just all cramped up. Well, the point is, she said, I think gas was 25 cents a gallon, and I'm not that old, so, I mean, boy, gas has gone right up, but... Tickets to Disney, I think she was saying that it was like $4. I mean, how does it go from that? It, it, it goes there because of the experience. And you know what else? If the experience is good enough, people talk about it. And you want your experience of working with you from the moment someone talks to you on the phone, just your confidence even, um, the next step. The, when they meet with you for the first time, when, they, when you onboard them as a new client, if you're in financial services or accounting or whatever that your business is, there are steps throughout the process. There are touch points. So what touch point can you think about? And maybe once a week, um, have you ever read the book E-Myth by Michael Gerber? He talks about working, taking time to work on your business, not in your business. So maybe the first Friday of every month, or the first Tuesday of every month, or the third Thursday, it doesn't matter, but you take a day where you go half a day, and you don't just sit in your office and turn the phones off because you'll get right back into it. You go somewhere, go to a park, go to a Starbucks, you know, your second office. Um, but think about things when you're working on your business, not in the business, because you're working in your business, you're fielding calls and putting out fires. Could you think of one touch point in your business that you could brainstorm and go, how could I make this exceptional for the customer or the prospect? How could I make this worthy of being talked about? Um, and and uh, I, I've heard it like this, how do you want to be remarkable? Well, being remarkable is being worthy of being remarked about. And you don't want the remarks to be negative, you want the remarks to be very positive. So with innovation, don't think that, well, I own a XYZ company and we can't afford all the new equipment to, be in, to have innovation. It could just be part of the process that's innovative. It could be part of your delivery of the solutions. It could be just enough different that people go, that's interesting, I've never heard it that way, right? Because people in your industry, whatever industry that you're in, Sometimes they use the same all, same all, and traditionally we provide this, and it's almost like set them up, knock them down. So how can you do, be a little bit different? So um, the next one is passion, the language of relationship. So the words there that you could use to either formulate your brand message or even use in your marketing. So think of some of these things like, um, let's, let's back up to innovation. Um, let's think of forward thinking. Our forward thinking executive team spent months of research and development in coming up with a new solution to fill in the blank to your target audience's need. And we now are excited to announce, you will, and through this innovation, ooh, wait a minute, we're, we're talking about forward thinking, innovation, announce, you will discover, and so you, using some of these words where that's like a one, that's one sentence, you put that together and people are like, oh, interesting. So how about the next one, passion? Expressive, warm, social, optimistic. 
So do you want your brand to be known as passionate? And, and you know, you think of that like maybe with some social causes, um, you know, um, corporate social responsibility. Maybe your business is to the point where you're ready to give back. Um, or maybe you want to grow to the point where you're ready to give back and um, to him who is faithful in the little will be given much. So you don't wait till you've got $100 gillion in revenues to give back. Give back now. If it's 20 bucks, give back to the community, to something where it gets you into that habit, right? Um, and, and then it primes the pump to where that becomes easy. So could you become the brand that is known as being passionate about something in your industry? So could you use words at, uh, such as these, or could you display um, being expressive, warm, social, and optimistic? Let's look at power. Um, when you think of power, what types of brands do you think of? Or what types of person do you think of? Um, and, and probably in your mind, you're thinking of some type of person, you know, the power broker, um, you know, some of the movies you see on TV, you know, the boiler rooms of, of things like that. But um, the language of confidence, they're assertive, they're decisive, and they're purposeful. And I, and I think the language of confidence is really key. Because if you're presenting a solution to a client, whatever that your business is, if you said, you know what, um, I heard what your need is, and you know, I really think this is the solution, how confident are you to go set me up, right? Because you're, I don't know, you're not very confident, but if you're like, you know what, I've got a lot of clients that had your exact need. This is exactly what you need, and here's why. Um, one time I had a different client that had this and what they experienced was, and you know, there's some research out there that tells you exactly what this will do for you, and I'm confident, and, and literally, why not use the word, you know, I'm so confident this is gonna work for you that this is exactly what I would tell my, my brother or my parents. So what I wanna do is explain how this will benefit you, and if it seems to fit, that's fine. But confidence, the language of confidence. So be assertive, be decisive. Don't be the bull in the china closet assertive, but just be assertive and confident, right? Um, how about the next one down, prestige. The language of excellence. Um, ambitious, respected, and elite. So there's some brands that I know we can think of that are the prestige brands. Maybe even they use prestige in their name, right? Um, think of some of these ones where, you know, the classical music is playing, there's the nice furniture, the, you know, they walk into the office and it's just opulent and that's prestige. And you want to be careful in the sense that you want to be talking to the right target audience when you are projecting those things. Because if someone that's not your target audience walks in and they see this, what do they think about your service and your price point and your value? Maybe they think that's just way above what I can do. And now that becomes not wrong that you did that. It's just you're not spending your time as wisely as you could. So you need to, we need to have our brand so dialed in in our own minds that we know how to communicate it and project it to our target audience so that when someone sees that or hears that, they go, yeah, 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 tell me more. And if your brand, depending on what your business is, could do with a little prestige, and you know what? That's not the be all, end all solution to every brand out there because there are some, some services that you don't need to be prestige. My, my sewer line backed up, I just wanna get some plumber that's gonna come help me out. I don't care if you pull up in a Rolls Royce or a limo, right? So all of these techniques and, and thoughts don't apply to everything. That's why you need to know your brand. Now, guess what? Um, we'll probably use that, that uh, plumber example um, in the very next one because let's look at trust, the language of stability. Is your brand, would you want your brand, um, would messaging about your brand be served well by being thought of as trust, stability. So stable, dependable, comforting, predictable. So let's think about um, that plumber. They want to be dependable, meaning timely. You know, isn't there some, some uh, company that, you know, like t Benjamin Franklin, I don't know, 24 hour, you know, we, ha what's one of the um, biggest complaints about service companies? You know, they're never on time and they give us this window in there. And, they're, and so what some companies have done is I'm going to go identify that that's a problem and I'm going to use that as my competitive advantage and say, we guarantee that we will be there within, you know, whatever, 10 minute window or whatever the case is. Or if we're late, we will, right? Remember Domino's back in the day? If we don't deliver within 30 minutes, we'll give you your pizza for free. 
and th that was the competitive advantage of, you know, and how about FedEx? When it absolutely positively has to be there overnight. Well, do you, do you know the story of FedEx? The owner did a uh, case study or a paper in college and the professor gave him a C. He was like, that's a, the dumbest idea ever. And let's see, it's FedEx now. Um, so, so guess what? If so, don't take, don't take just someone's negative word. If you feel like you've got something, some new initiative or new venture, don't just jump into it. Don't throw a bunch of money at it blindly. Pray about it and all of those things. But if you really feel that you've got something, don't let your comment or your comment or your comment dissuade you. You know, be be persistent with that. Um, but look at that trust. Many brands are going to do very well, and most brands are going to do very well with developing that feeling of trust. Because sometimes you're giving advice to people that you've got to have some trust. You know, um, in the financial services, in any kind of a field, I, don't, I really don't care How about this car. We've got two automotive and, and we've got financial services. It, which industry needs to have more trust? Car industry or financial services? Thank you. That was a trick question, by the way, and Ed wins. It, it, they're both the exact same. Because have you heard horror stories about financial services professionals giving bad advice? And have you heard the same type of horror stories with people in the finan in, in, uh, automotive? You know, oh, we, we replaced this part, and they didn't replace the part. Whatever the, the thing is, or, you know, oh, your money is safe, and it's not. Trust transcends so much in every vertical, and if that becomes part of your brand messaging, and you and use some of these words like stable, dependable, comforting, predictable, you know what? Let's compare the word predictable up to our first one, um, innovative. Being innovative is not being predictable, but it's not being reckless either. Being innovative is always having something fresh, and nine out of ten times that, that fresh idea is going to pan out and work, but it's always like, oh, I want to stick with that person. I want to see what, what they're going to come up with next. But being trustworthy and predictable is the opposite. But is that a bad thing? Nope. Because sometimes people just want to, you know, how about this? When you, and I think we, yeah, we use Domino's. When you order your pizza, do you want it to be one way one day? And one, no, you just want to go in and go, give me my pizza, and I want it to taste the same way, right? How many times do you go to a restaurant, the same restaurant, pick whatever one is your favorite? Have you ordered every single thing on their menu? What's your favorite meal at your favorite restaurant? How many times do you pick that? Because we go to whatever restaurant, and I, I'm like, don't even give me the menu. <laughs> I'll take the, right, you know, so my favorite is Spaghetti Factory, so I'll take the half meat, half mazithra, manager special, you know, Thousand Island on the salad, done. Well, that's being dependable, because guess what? Every time I get that, it tastes the same, and it's like, yeah, that's Spaghetti Factory. How can you make your business, your brand, your products and your services deliver in such a way that your customers and clients and prospects realize that you're dependable, you're trustworthy, and it's going to be solid delivery? Now, you can make little enhancements and being you can touch on innovative, you know, kind of like I majored in and I minored in in college. You can major in your brand being trust, but you can minor in innovation because you can make slight little differences in how it's being delivered without changing your dependability. Let's look at mystique, the language of listening. So private curio and curiosity provoking. There's some brands that want that kind of velvet rope um, behind closed doors, backstage kind of a mystique. You know, um, and that incites curiosity and gets back to some of those things that drive us and pull us because it's like, ooh, wait a minute, if I pay $100, I get to get early access to something and I get to have backstage whatever, I get to have lunch with the speaker. Have, has anyone in here ever paid money or extra money because you got something a little bit extra for something you were doing? Could you think of something that way? You know, and, and in, in reality, it is kind of like, how about this? Um, has anyone sat in line for the latest iPhone? Oh, wait a minute. They just came out with a new one, right? So has anyone waited in line, even overnight, but waited in line because I want to get, and you were, that's in, in that bell curve, that's called you're the early adopter. And then up here is where everyone comes in, and then down here it's like, okay, you know, like my phone is still the Galaxy S3. It's like, I think it still even works, possibly. But, um, if you are one where you want the stuff now, why do you want that? 
Because did you buy that latest version of the iPhone and put it in your pocket and when you pull it out and use it, you never, or what is the first thing you did when you got it? You tweeted it out, just got my new iPhone, or check this, you know, because you want that, you want to be seen as someone that is in the know, right? So that, that is because you are responding to that mystique. And then the last one is alert, the language of details. So this could, again, we could probably think of through our introductions, we could think of some of the brands that would fit into this. Organized, efficient, precise, detailed. And if we really got, went deeper, we can go, hey, you know what, alert uh, ties in with trust. Hmm, because if you can trust me, why is it that you're trusting me? It's because maybe I'm really organized. Um, have you ever dealt with a business where they missed the appointment or were late? or they took calls in between, or they're shuffling papers when you're in, you're going, really, I'm here to do some business. And so can you be organized, efficient, precise, and detailed, which when you accomplish that, that also accomplishes building that trust. So can you use some of those phrases and words? And even in your one-to-one -one conversations, you know what, let me just tell you, one of the things that makes us a, very different than our competitors out there is we tend to have and we tend to really focus on, right? You know, like uh, in our auto shop, you can eat off of our floors. Not necessarily, literally, but the point is when they see that, if you're precise in that, then you're gonna be precise in this and this and this as well. When you are very, very organized in that, pro that experience that the customer has from the first moment that they call into you, and let me tell you, if you have companies that are big enough where you have employees and people that answer the phones, You've done a lot of work to create your brand, to do some marketing and advertising, that someone saw it out here, that they checked out this, and then they're calling in to you to say, I want to learn more, I need to come in. And all of that can be ruined if the person answering your phone is not as helpful as they could be. Or how about this, if they don't answer the phone at all. So, if, so for instance, if you have a lot of incoming calls, don't just let it roll to the machine and pick it up later, right? Hire a service for sometimes extremely ineffect in, in, um, ineffective, um, not expensive, extremely affordable, and have somebody answering the phone. Okay, good. Thank you for calling. And you know, you know what is it that you're looking for? Super. Okay, well, Tom's going to be uh, back, getting back to you with you. I'm taking his calls now because he's out on appointment. And um, now, what's the best number? Okay, super. Hey, we're looking forward to connecting with you. We'll talk to you real soon. Okay, cool. Now Tom gets that, and maybe he's out in the field doing whatever Tom does, and maybe he can even take a moment and call right there because, you know what? Boy, you did a lot of work to get that person to even notice your brand and then pick up the phone, and whether it's a phone or a filling out a form on your website or an email. Um, I, I think this might be industry-wide, you know, but has anyone heard of the sunset policy? I don't know whether it was just a company I used to work for years ago that had the sunset policy. If you get an inquiry before 3 p.m., you get back to them that same day. And if it's after 3, before noon the next day. Because how many times have you, have you guys ever um, seen those little chat boxes at the bottom of a website? How many times have you chosen to do that rather than sending in an email? Because nobody's going to answer an email, in theory, or open up a support ticket, right? Why do you want that chat? There's been times, like for instance, um, Amazon, they're Amazon. Because do you, do you know that back before Amazon was Amazon? What was an Amazon? Why did they pick, what's a Google? Now, now it's like a verb and it's part of, you know, oh, just Google it. But back then, what was a Google? What was an Amazon? They built their brand to be what it is today. But to give you the example, look at um, organized, efficient, on the alert and look at trust, okay? And even let's look at, let's tie in innovation. Who in here has a website? Most everyone. Who in here has to talk to a customer before they do business with you? Do you just wake up and you have money just come in because they found you and they just paid you money? Uh-uh. Because whatever you do, you've got to have a conversation. Sometimes, um, in some of your businesses, it's a longer sales cycle because it's a complicated process, right? If you were selling pencils, do you want red or blue? And uh, number two is 10 cents, how many do you want? That's easy. 
but most of the time you've got to have conversations with people. So can you or how can you on your website make yourself super accessible? Well, I've got a contact button right there on my website. My phone number's right there. Yeah, but they're on, they've got their finger on their mouse. And have you ever heard of this um, concept of um, you want to respond in kind? So have you ever been in a um, heated discussion <coughs> argument with someone and when you kind of raise your voice and they raise your voice and then it gets re... Or have you, how about, wow, uh, Proverbs what says a soft answer turns away wrath? So maybe in a heated conversation, what if you just kind of, you know, you're right. Does that just diffuse it, right? So in, where I'm going with that is people respond in kind. So if they are on your website and you have it the, you know, flashing at the top, call us today, well, they're probably on their phone or on their website. They don't necessarily want to talk to you, but guess what? They might want to click on something. And here's, I, I'm not even recommending a, a product, but there's many that do this for a very cheap, you know, like $10, $15 a month where it's a chat box. And it's a little thing down at the bottom right, and it's either just a box, and maybe it'll fade in, you know, hey, hey, how can we help you today? And maybe rather than opening up a support ticket or emailing you, they go, you know what, I was just wondering about... And what if you are out in the field? You can have those programmed to ping your phone, and you can be stop right there and say, someone's right on my website live, real time, and you just answer right back. It's kind of like a text. Why not set that up? Because some of these basic questions that people have before they pick up the phone to call you or come in could be answered. And you know what? There have been times that I myself and I've had clients of mine say, we got that piece of business because we responded quickly. Maybe even a competitor had a better deal than us and we had a higher price, but they chose us. Why? Because nine questions later, we were answering the questions and responding, and the other guy was still back on questions number one, and two weeks ago, haven't responded. But they knew that we, you know, whatever firm that you're in, we were responsive. That goes a long way in that branding process. So, in conclusion, if we take a look through both of these pages and this whole process, think of that one thing that you could take away and go, you know what, I don't have the exact answer, but I'm going to focus on this one thing in the next one week, in the next week, right? So take, take a, a two-hour block of time to work on your business, not in your business, because that's huge. If you can take scheduled times that way in your business to work on specific parts, and I would say to you in the branding aspect, work with what you already have. Clarify that competitive advantage and then work with, you know, you, you might not need to get 200 more customers a day. You might just need to go, all right, the, the X number of customers that I do currently have, how can I really make their process of working with me just amp it up a little bit? Which then goes into that innovation. How can I innovate my process? Just from even the delivery, like the, the chat box. Like, Ooh, that's kind of nice. How about when someone... Um, hangs up the phone with you and maybe completes a piece of business, what do you do? Hopefully, you send something out to them, a thank you email or a th How about if you jumped on, you know, and there's some little tools this way where you can do even just like a, a quick audio or a video message using your webcam. Maybe it's just an audio, maybe you're like, ah, I don't even comb my hair until noon, so I'm gonna do a quick audio message. Hey, you know what, thanks Tom for uh, that quick chat that we have. Here, here's another, um, tip on innovation and customer experience. And we'll close with this one. Um, how many people in here are in, get inquiries from people and you have to go over like a proposal or a report or something with them to go over details, right? And sometimes when I ask that question, they're like, oh yeah, all the time, no matter what industry it's in. And sometimes you like to do it in person, but maybe before that in-person meeting, you give them this, um, maybe it's a one-page summary document, and you pull it up on your computer, and you push this button that starts recording what's on your screen, not you, but what's on your screen, and you've got, you know, the microphone on your computer, maybe just a quick external mic, and you go, hey, you know what, um, Betty, looking forward to talking to you next week. I just want to show you this real quick. This is some initial findings that I have, and we're going to go in a lot more detail because I've got about seven pages that I want to show you exactly, but Point number one here is, I think what we can do, and point number two, hey, look forward to talk to you then, 45 seconds, and you send them a link and go, hey, looking forward to next week, um, I, I, here's a quick little video overview for you, and they click on that and it opens up and, and it's your voice and you're talking about some specifics, but it's not giving away everything because you still wanna, you still wanna develop what? Look at passion, the language of relationship. 
you don't want to push people away by only phone and email and electronic. You want that, that relationship. But, you know, kind of like um, the Bible says a little salt, you know, it will increase the savor of a food, but too much, you know, and a little honey, but too much. Well, maybe balance in business is you don't want to just live on the techie apps and instant chat and all that, but maybe that is just enough flavor to go, oh, that's really, okay, good, that's helpful. And then when you get together, you feel like you already know that person client-wise, and they feel like they know you, and then now you're going over what you're presenting. So hope those were some good ideas on just how you can take concepts that are business concepts, and let's wrap it right back up with going to the first page. Look at through some of these verses and see where we can, number one, Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God. Um, number two, Proverbs 9, 1, wisdom has builded her house. Um, and, and guess what? There's another verse that talks about seek wisdom and wait outside wisdom's gates. What does that mean? It means that seek is an action verb. We have to do a little bit of work. We can't just go download and cable in the back of our neck and we've got wisdom and we've got all this. It takes work. So we have to desire to build our brand based on godly principles. We have to desire that wisdom and we have to look for it. You know, so many times it's like, if that was a snake, it would have bit me. That's a, it's right in front of me. So, so many times throughout our day, there are opportunities, and maybe we, are, we have filled our day so much that we are just flying, and we fly by. And maybe if we could look back on it, and the Lord would show us, you know, hey, you know what, yesterday, look at this. This was perfect, right? And you just missed it. Maybe this way to give someone a word of encouragement was just something that would have made you pause and go, oh, that, that's what it's all about not zipping off to do the other 14 things that, because you know what, at the end of every day, do, does everyone have their to-do list to done, and you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs going, when's five o'clock going to come because I am done? Never. So when you do shut down, there's always stuff that can be done. So be organized and diligent so that the next day you can get right to it and feel, um, work through your list, because that, that personal integrity and that personal diligence and organization will show through in your customers and prospects and they'll see that. So with that, let's uh, close in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for just your word and thank you for how timeless your word is and how we can apply things to our daily lives today, to our business today, and help us to see um, through your eyes and wisdom and, and uh, just give us the favor that we need each and every day to know that we can rest in you, that we can um, just watch for your uh, hand of leading and open doors and opportunities and just help us as we give advice and execute on plans and uh, deliver on services that we do for our clients each and every day that we would do it with diligence and uh, joy and passion and innovation and just to be able to tie all of these things into uh, making a better business for ourselves so that when people ask us what makes you so different that we can uh, point them into your direction and say well we we uh, feel like we are doing this for our customers, but at the same time for the glory of the Lord. And we just uh, pray that uh, you would give us these types of opportunities and clarity of thought. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so just uh, remember, <laughs> I, um, I forgot to put the actual website, but if you put Kingdom Business Alliance, um, just it's kingdombusinessalliance.com, make sure you check out our website from time to time because all of the events are on the event calendar. Also, like Jim mentioned, um, Joyco it does our filming and typically within a week we will have this video so that if you didn't get every single word um, you can re-watch this video. Um, I'll post the, the notes here um, on there so in case you spilled some orange juice you know we can, this will be up there you can re-download it or how about this do you know someone you know that one thing that you are going to take away do you know one person that could benefit from this message or other messages. So go through the media page and see through our um, past uh, meetings and see if you can recommend, hey, you know what, let me email the link over to my friend. They would really benefit by this, and maybe that's a way you can minister to them.